As he uh, got up to preach, the door of the church opened and in came a lady that he knew from the housing estate where he ministered. A lady who had had no church background or uh, contact with the church at all, but whom he'd come across uh, in a pastoral capacity just briefly. And he let out a cry to God as he began to preach, as preachers often do, and he said to God, Lord, you've got this wrong, as preachers often say to God as they stand to preach and see who's in front of them. He said, Lord, this woman should have come last week. She would have understood what I was talking about now, but of all the times when this dear lady, who isn't particularly clever and has no Bible knowledge and no church background, of all the times to send her, first of all, to church, you send her today, when I'm expanding the priesthood of Melchizedek. Couldn't you have done better than that? Well, at the end of the service as she was going out, he was standing at the door shaking hands, and uh, he said to her somewhat apologetically, lovely to see you, uh, but I'm sorry that you, you came into the middle of what's uh, quite a difficult thing, trying to explain all about the priesthood of Melchizedek. Uh, I, I hope you caught on. I'll um, come round and explain to you in the week a bit further, if you like. And she replied, no, no, it's fine. I understood everything you said about Melchizedek. But who was this Abraham you kept on about? <laughs> well, I hope you understand everything about Melchizedek this morning. <laughs> and Abraham. I suspect that we find it's fairly difficult territory as we come to this part of Hebrews that introduces us to Jesus as the great high priest that we can trust after the order of Melchizedek. And I suspect we find it difficult for two reasons. Firstly, because we don't know our Old Testaments enough. We claim as evangelicals to be biblical Christians too often we're epistle Christians, we're not even gospel Christians, sometimes we're New Testament Christians, but we really need to demonstrate more than we have done in recent years that we are biblical Christians and we believe in the authority and inspiration of the whole of Scripture. The Old Testament is not irrelevant and it is certainly not dull. And we need an understanding of the Old Testament if we're going to come and understand this teaching of the priesthood of Melchizedek. But I suspect there's a second reason why we find it hard to grasp, and that is that maybe many of us have an emotional blockage about priesthood. We have uh, looked at other sections of the Christian church that have perhaps abused the concept of priesthood and who've warped it from a human viewpoint and magnified men as priests and for once the non-exclusive language applies, the non-inclusive language applies, and uh, we have backed off from any concept of priesthood. And yet priesthood is one of those uh, almost universal categories. Wherever people have a hankering after the spirit, a reaching out for God, I'm not saying a good one necessarily, but wherever there is that human instinct to relate to God, there you will find priests. And the answer to bad concepts about priesthood is not to dismiss them and pretend they don't exist, but to grasp what is a true and adequate and authentic concept of priesthood. And it's Jesus as our priest that we examine this morning. Some of you will find that, I hope, very comforting and reassuring. We ended our last session with words of challenge. The only hope we have of salvation is if we persevere in following Jesus Christ and honoring him. But as Martin Luther said about these verses, after terrifying us, the apostle now comforts us. After pouring wine into the wound and thus making us smart, 
he now pours in oil. Christians should not consider themselves. Are we working hard enough? Are we following closely enough? Are we running fast enough? Are we keeping up sufficiently? Christians should not consider themselves, but Jesus, and have their confidence in him. Now I want this morning as we consider this passage, Hebrews 4, 14 through to 5, 10, to do something for me somewhat unusual, and that is to start in the middle and go forwards and then end with the beginning, if you see what I mean. I want to reverse the biblical text. So we're going to look at chapter 5 first of all, and then come back to those marvellous words at the end of chapter 4. And if you want a framework again this morning, we'll be speaking in terms of three different things. First of all, we will be looking at an explanation that comes in verses 1 to 5 of chapter 5. We'll then move on to look at an exposition, and I'll explain the difference between an explanation and an exposition in a moment. From explanation, we move to an exposition in chapter 5, verses 5 to 10. And then finally, we go back to those verses at the end of chapter 4 to consider an exhortation. So we begin with words of explanation. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Jewish believers would have been on very familiar ground as the whole idea of the priesthood was explained to them. You know by now how the author to the Hebrews, when he wants to make a point, regularly reaches back to a verse from the Old Testament to prove it. But in this chapter he reaches not just back to a verse, but to a whole concept, a whole major theme of Old Testament worship, the theme of the priest. And in these five verses, he explains to them, by way of reminder, some of the salient features of priesthood. In verse 1, he talks about the task of the priest. He is there to represent men in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. We have just come through a period where we spent our time electing representatives to Parliament. We might have saved our time because many of them, when they get in Parliament, will forget that actually they're there to represent the likes of you and me. They'll probably represent themselves and their own career plans, or they'll represent their party, or they'll represent powerful interests, either of industry and business, or of unions that help to put them there, but maybe they will not always remember that it was you and I who put the cross on the piece of paper that asked them to go to Westminster to represent us. But the priest has the task always of representing us before God. And specifically, he represents us in the area of sin. I don't know what you think a priest is, some people have an idea that he's an expert in liturgy. That he knows the difference between right 13A and a half and third right 13B and a half. And can tell you and argue in minute details as to why you should use one particular formula of words or another. And there are all sorts of weird and wonderful ideas of what the priest is there to do. But here is the heart of it. This is what he's really about. He is to stand before God on your behalf and mine and to deal with the issue of sins. And the Old Testament priest did so by offering sacrifices, gifts and sacrifices. The author of the Hebrews probably doesn't have any particular distinction in mind when he talks about gifts on the one hand and sacrifices on the other. He wasn't trying to make a point, he was just using a general phrase to illustrate that what he was about was to reconcile people to the God that they had offended by their sin. And the way in which he did it was to offer sacrifices, a whole variety of sacrifices, some which involved blood and some which did not involve blood. 
some which were sacrifices in terms of burnt offerings and atonement offerings, some which were fellowship offerings and thanksgiving offerings, but all hinged on this need to reconcile people to their God. So that's what the priest is about, the task of representation. How was one qualified to become a priest? What makes him able to be the representative between God and human beings? Well, the qualifications need to come suitably from two ends. In verse 1 we read that he is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them. In verse 4 we read that he is the one who doesn't take the honour upon himself but must be called by God. Now it's uh, very appropriate that the qualifications from the, for the priest should come from both directions at once. You don't need to tell me, uh, you don't need me to tell you rather this morning that the priest, when the word is translated into the Latin language, becomes a, a, a bridge, a pontifex. And you don't need me to remind you how bridges are built. The bridges are built not by someone starting a construction in the middle of the river or the ravine and then working out towards banks on either side, but bridges are always built by starting at both sides on both banks and spanning the river or the ravine and meeting in the middle. And here is the priest who represents you and me before God and it is appropriate therefore that his qualifications come from both directions at once. He is selected from among men in order that he might be a suitable human representative before God that he might have understanding and feeling and that he might be qualified as a human being but at the same time the qualifications come from God and he is appointed by God. Now if that was true of the Old Testament priests as it was you can see it in the selection of Aaron for instance in Exodus chapter uh, 28 onwards. If it was true of priests who followed in Aaron's footsteps. It was even more true of Jesus Christ, as we shall come to see. We've talked about the task of the priest and the qualification of the priest. Verse 2 highlights the manner of the priest, as the priesthood is explained further. He is there, we read, as one who is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and who are going astray. He is to be a generous, gracious, forbearing pastor of the people who can deal with magnanimity with their problems and their sins. Now you may not particularly like that idea because there are a fair number of evangelicals who don't seem terribly attracted by gentleness. There is a relationship others have identified about evangelical Christianity between evangelicalism and authoritarianism. Some of us like it hot. You know the sort of congregations who are really composed of Christian masochists. They are never happier than when the preacher is whipping them and beating them and telling them how rotten they are and how much better they ought to be. And uh, that's not a phenomenon, just um, there are some preachers, I ought to say, who are Christian sadists, but that's the other side of the coin. <laughs> that's not a phenomenon which is just uh, limited to evangelicals. Actually, in the ancient world, when this letter was written, there were quite a number of wandering philosophers and teachers who all had their schools of uh, disciples. And there was quite a debate amongst the, the, the Greek world of philosophers as to whether you should be gentle with your congregation or not. And the predominant uh, idea, the predominant conclusion was that you shouldn't. That if you were gentle, almost certainly you were flattering your congregation. You were soft-soaping them. And you weren't uh, telling them the truth. And that the way to win people was to be uh, rude to them and to disdain them and to challenge them and to be harsh with them. 
So it isn't only Christians who suffer sometimes from that. But maybe we need to learn again that the priest was there to be gentle with people. We have thrown out the hymn, Gentle Jesus, Meek and Mild, and I can understand why. And yet maybe we have lost something of the gentle father heart of God in doing so. so Paul could certainly write to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ I appeal to you. The Old Testament priest was certainly one who was expected to be gentle with people. Note an important qualification to that. The people with whom he was meant to be gentle with those who were ignorant and going astray. Not those who were willful rebels and deliberate sinners who knew the truth and understood it but flagrantly disobeyed it. But he was supposed to be gentle with, as William Barclay puts it, a man who was swept away in a moment of impulse or anger or passion. Gentle when a man was mastered by some overmastering temptation. When a man had repented in sorrow for something that he had done. I tell you this issue is on our agenda in the churches today. Thank God that he has moved by his spirit across our land in recent years and there is a whole first generation of Christians being converted. Not folks who've grown up in the church, not folks who've had Christian parents and grandparents, but those who are coming to faith in Christ often out of the ruins of a life, bringing the scars of rejection and of failure with them, bringing the bruises of having gone their own way instead of God's way, coming so often with broken marriages or with patterns of addiction or the consequences of immorality or of crime. And across the country, those are the people that are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And thank God it is so. But some of our churches are ill-equipped to cope with them. We know the Bible so well we have our traditions of respectability so firmly entrenched. We are so clear about our moral frameworks that in many churches it is difficult to deal gently with such people. For they are the ignorant, if I may use those terms, who've gone astray, who want to come back. And they don't always immediately or easily cotton on because they haven't got the foundation or the background to do so. They don't always immediately live up to the expectations of those uh, well-tried, uh, well-worn, I was going to say, crusty members of the PCC or the diaconate who've been around for years and know what it is to be a proper Christian. Why do these people behave like this? I remember one evening in the church where I was pastor, uh, a couple came in just by way of trivial example, who'd never been to church before, and as I began to preach my sermon, so a few rows back, they took out a can of Coke from their uh, case, their bag, and they pulled it. And there was this delightful sound of uh, a uh, psst. <laughs> and then a pouring going on. The reason I particularly noticed was because I was jelly jealous. <laughs> I just had some miserable cold water there in the pulpit beside me which was probably left over from last week. <laughs> but I remember the conversation afterwards amongst some of the church. Why don't these people know how they ought to behave in church? Well, of course they don't. They've never been there. Why should they? And there needs to be this spirit of gentleness for such people. Oh, not for the respectable church members who know it all. <laughs> Maybe there is room for some harsh talking there from time to time but gentleness for those who are ignorant and who've gone astray that's part of the priestly ministry that we need thank god for the rise of a prophetic ministry among us but let's make sure it's balanced by a priestly ministry among us the hard words and the strong words and the visionary words 
need to be married with the gentle pastoral touch. But then fourthly, as we look at the task of the priest, the background to the priest by way of explanation, we've seen his task and his qualifications and his manner. Look with me in verse 3 at his limitations. One of the reasons why the priest was to be gentle was because he was a human being who needed to be aware of his own frailty. He knew that he was a sinner too. And that was the strength in the one hand that enabled him to represent human beings before God. He knew what it was like to be human, but that was the weakness on the other hand. Our strengths and our weaknesses so often go together. The weakness was that not only could he represent other people as a human being, but before he represented them, he had to represent himself. He had sins that needed dealing with. And the great uh, festival of the Day of Atonement, as the, the outline of that day is, is put uh, forth in Leviticus chapter 16. So we read that before Aaron offered sacrifices for anybody else, verse 6 says Aaron is to offer a bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. That was the limitation of the priests in the Old Testament. That they were good examples of what it meant to be a priest, but they were not perfect examples because they had to atone for their own sins first. But we have a great high priest who though he follows in those traditions and relates to the explanation that we have given, goes far beyond anything that they perceived of as priesthood in the Old Testament. So from explanation, we now move to exposition. An exposition differs from explanation because it starts with explanation, but it goes beyond it. It takes the explanation and it unfolds it and it applies it. This morning, we do that in reference to the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And we look at verses 5 to 10, where the concept of priesthood is expanded in relation to him. We begin where verse 4 left off, talking about the qualifications of priesthood. Let's look at the election of Jesus Christ to his priesthood. Self-advancement, verse 5 warns us, is no good. Nobody puts himself in the office of a priest. If he does, it's of no value. Self-advertisement in that office is useless. He needs a mandate and authority to offer himself as priest that comes from outside. And God himself, the Father, gives the mandate and authority to his Son, as only he can, to be the great high priest. Throughout his earthly life, Jesus constantly was aware that he derived his authority from God. John chapter 8 and verse 54, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim is your God, is the one who glorifies me. Here we have it in terms of the quotation yet again from Psalm 2 verse 7. It's already been quoted once in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 5. So crucial is it. You are my son. Today I have become your father. A prophetic proclamation there in the Psalms of the son who was to come, Jesus Christ, to be owned by the father, the great high priest, revealed and confirmed in public baptism that he was the son of God and that we need to listen to him. Verse 5 talks about the glory of becoming a high priest and the way in which that glory needs to be bestowed by someone else. But we need to be aware too that as we talk about that word glory, it doesn't mean the glory of status or the glory of prestige or of position, for there is a sting in the tail. John's Gospel talks about glory more than many parts of Scripture and the way in which Jesus reveals the glory of God. But how does he reveal it? 
most clearly, most perfectly, not in the supernatural acts of wonder or the dazzling works of miracles, but he reveals it most in the cross. Look at John chapter 12, verse 23, or John chapter 13, verse 31, where glory is related most to the cross of Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus was elected by the Father to this glorious position. But that glorious position was to be a priest by reigning from a cross. <coughs> Hebrews expounds the concept of priesthood in relationship to Jesus, not only as far as his election goes, but as far as his heritage goes, his forerunners go, his forebears. Look at verse 6. And he says in another place, that other place incidentally is Psalm 110 verse 4. He says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And so we come to this mysterious character, Melchizedek. He's introduced to us, first of all, in Scripture in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. We read there that he is the king of Salem, who brings bread and wine to Abraham. But the same verse that speaks of him as a king also goes on to say he was a priest. He was priest of God Most High. And he becomes, therefore, a very suitable model for the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Let me try to explain to you why. How could Jesus be both king and priest? It was important that he should be if these readers for the, of the letters to the Hebrews weren't going to be distracted from their commitment to Christ and attracted to that strange teaching that was coming from the Jewish renewal sect in the Dead Sea. The Jews thought two different messiahs would come, let me remind you. One would be a king and one would be a priest. But the claim by Christians is that Jesus is the one messiah who is, as we have seen, both king and priest. But there's a problem with that, if you're a Jew at least. How could that be so? There was a conundrum that you had to work through. I mean, if he was a priest, surely he would have had to have been of the tribe of Leba, Levi, a son of Aaron. But he wasn't. He came from the tribe of Judah, of the family of David. So, okay, maybe he could be a royal personage, a king, because the tribe of Judah, the family of David, was the kingly tribe. But surely he couldn't be both at once. Well, the author to the Hebrews here says there's a resolution to that riddle, which is really quite simple. Think back to your Old Testaments, he says, and you will understand how it can be that Jesus can be both priest and king at one and the same time. It's all there, the clues are there in the Old Testament. He's not a priest at all according to the order of Aaron, the family of Aaron, the, the tribe of Levi. All right, maybe that would be a puzzle if, if that's the sort of priest he was. But he's a priest from the, the order of Melchizedek, standing in the shoes of Melchizedek, the uh, order of Melchizedek. And that solves the riddle, because when you're introduced to Melchizedek, first of all, he is revealed there it is in Genesis 14, 18, both as king and priest. And it gets even better. Melchizedek was king of Salem, that is of Jerusalem. And when David became king in Jerusalem, he followed in the shoes of Melchizedek. He was the heir of Melchizedek as the king of that city. Melchizedek was not only the forerunner of Jesus, but very clearly he was the forerunner of David too. So actually in David's line, there is priesthood as well as kingship. 
In David's time, that priesthood was exercised by the family of Zadok, not the family of Aaron, the Levites. And it's that heritage, it's that order that Jesus takes up. Now that solves, a, perhaps for many people, a mental riddle. But the significance for you and I is it's another of those windows that you can look through. And as you see Jesus as the priest of the order of Melchizedek, so you look out onto a whole vista of, of uh, possibilities as to what that priesthood means. <coughs> Chapter 7 of Hebrews expounds it more fully and more clearly. And we can only just pick up one or two little incidents from it this morning. It means that it's a non-Jewish priesthood, a universal priesthood, that it's not limited just to one nation or to one race. You and I as Gentiles have a priest this morning in Jesus Christ. It means, as chapter 7, verse 3 says about Melchizedek, this mysterious figure who was without father and mother and without genealogy and without beginning of days or end of life, like the Son of God, he remains priest forever. And there's an insight into the whole mystery of who Jesus was, to the fact that he was the ancient of days, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the one from eternity and to eternity. There locked into the order of Melchizedek is the mystery of the incarnation. That the almighty son of God by whom the worlds were made somehow becomes the son of a human mother and is born as a fragile baby in Bethlehem. The priesthood of Melchizedek gives you an insight into the great qualifications and background and mystery of the son. Look at chapter 7 and verse 16. One has become a priest not on the basis of regulation as to ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. There already captured in the priesthood of Melchizedek is a hint of the resurrection that Jesus was to experience. An indestructible life. Though put to death, he lives now forever. The priesthood of Melchizedek is one that shows him to be greater than Abraham. For Abraham, as verses 4 to 10 of chapter 7 spells out, was the one who came and bowed down at Melchizedek's feet and received blessing from him and gave offerings to him. The Jews look back to Abraham as the great founder of the nation. Was there any greater than him? Yes, there was. A universal king of Salem, priest of the God Most High, called Melchizedek, in whose footsteps Jesus follows. From that wonderful concept, we find ourselves plunged into difficulty. We've talked about the election of Jesus and the, the order in which Jesus stands. In verse 7, we turn to the prayer of Jesus. And I say we find ourselves plunged into difficulty because uh, the verse is difficult to understand and the concept of which it speaks is even more difficult in a way to come to terms with. A priest is one who prays. And so naturally Hebrews moves from verse 6 to talking about the prayer life of Jesus, the priest who prayed. But it's a curious pray prayer that he prays for during his life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who would save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. I say it's difficult because maybe we don't like to come to terms with the concept of a priest who is ministering before God in weakness with tears and with loud cries. We like a priest who can sail through, unruffled by any disturbance, with his calm, never ruffled at all. But Jesus wasn't like that. He knew what it was to share human weakness and to cry out in agony and to be fearful before the oncoming cross. 
He cried out many times during his life. But maybe the picture in the mind of the author more than any was the picture of Jesus at this point in Gethsemane staring into the face of the cross and asking that he might, if it be the will of God, be delivered from it. It highlights for us the depth to which Jesus sank on our behalf as our priest. It highlights for us the human frailty of Jesus as he became a man. It highlights for us the very awfulness of the cross which he endured for us. Never try to smooth that over or make it out to be a nice experience. For there he submitted to the fierceness of God's wrath against us. There he went, underwent an experience of incomparable horror. There the curse of God fell on him and the powers of darkness did their worst to him. There he bore all the filth and the dirt and the wickedness of humanity. There he took the curse of our broken and sinful world into his own body. Human depravity and fallenness and sinfulness did their worst to him as he was lifted up to die. The pain was not just physical or emotional, but it was spiritual. As in that awful cry of anxiety, he knew himself to be rejected by God and suffered separation anxiety. That was the priest who cried out for you and for me. Embarrassing, shameful, difficult to come to terms with. But it's what makes him a great high priest. But the difficulty is also there in the verse. Not only because we find it difficult to come to terms with that sort of human priest for us. But because it says that he, was, he cried out to be saved from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. And yet he died. So in what sense was his prayer heard? Various suggestions have been made that I just lay before you this morning. Some have said that he was heard in that he was given strength to endure the cross. The angels came to his assistance and he was able to face it and to go through with it. Some have said that he was heard because he was set free from the fear of it by his crying and his prayer and he was able to endure it. Possibly the best explanation is that he was heard in the sense that though he went through death, he was saved from death. For on the third day he rose again. And here is a reference to his prayer being answered by the resurrection. Maybe I suggest to you, you shouldn't hurry past the difficulty of those words to neat solutions too quickly. For maybe there is an indication there, just a sideways reference to the fact that our great high priest is one who so enters into our experience that he understands the difficulty too of not having prayers immediately and obviously answered. Maybe he was like us also in not being able to unravel every mystery and not being able to know immediate solutions to everything and not always having prayers answered. So those are the great concepts of the priesthood of Jesus. We note in passing and more hurriedly in verse 8 the training that he underwent to be a priest. We learn to be obedient because we are threatened usually with dire consequences if we're disobedient. We want to avoid those unpleasant consequences so we obey. For Christ it was quite the reverse. He learned obedience from what he suffered. He learned to obey and in doing so he learned that uh, to obey was to cause suffering, was to lead him into difficulty. His career of public obedience inaugurated at uh, the early baptism in water was to be climaxed in a second baptism of fire, the baptism of the cross. Obedience for Jesus did not always mean a comfortable, easy life. 
and obedience for you and for me doesn't promise a comfortable or easy life either. Here, as you look at the great high priest, is encouragement to persevere even in difficulty. And then look at the effect. The result of this great high priest's work, he became a source of salvation once he was made perfect. I remind you that being made perfect when applied to Jesus doesn't mean to say that he had his faults corrected, but that he became fully qualified to be our saviour. That he who was the perfect son, now through his obedience becomes the perfect saviour. And there's something very appropriate about this. For it says that because he was obedient, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And he leads you and I, not just to a life of forgiveness, but to a life of obedience. So we see the great picture expounded of Jesus as our great high priest after the order of Melchizedek, far surpassing any idea of priesthood that the Old Testament uh, ever had and that people ever really conceived or perceived there. The one who is the perfect high priest for you and for me. From the explanation in the Old Testament and the exposition as it is applied to Jesus. So we move back to chapter 4, to the exhortation as it is applied to you and I as believers. What does this all mean? An exhortation is an encouragement to apply in practice in our lives what has been taught. Sometimes I think the church suffers from too much exhortation. We're sometimes too keen to exhort when we haven't laid the foundation and given the explanation. But once we've got the explanation, it's no good unless we live by it, unless we apply it, unless we turn our wills to obeying it and living by it. And that's where exhortation comes in. And here is the exhortation for us. The central issue is that we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. And we are encouraged to do two things in respect of that great high priest. Firstly, we are encouraged to hold fast to him. Let us hold fast, verses 14 and 15 say. Don't give up, because you have a high priest in heaven, who is a worthy representative for you. He's gone through the heavens. Some Jews thought there were three heavens, some Jews thought there were seven heavens. It's not a technical point that the author to the Hebrews is trying to make here, so that the scholars can argue over whether it was three or seven that he was talking about. It's something far greater than that. The author to the Hebrews would be impatient with that type of argument. The fact is, he says, that he transcends everything in the universe and now is seated at the right hand of God on high. He's there at the control center of the universe where it all happens and where it all matters. And you couldn't have a more suitable representative there than you have. Look at what verse 15 tells you about him and why you should hold fast to him. Firstly, because of his sympathy. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Rather, we've got one who is sympathetic to you. His divine majesty doesn't disqualify him from being a human representative. We've already seen his manhood makes him sympathetic. He is there as a suitable representative, able to give you all the TLC, all the tender loving care that you could want. That's a staggering picture of God. It was a novel picture of God when Christians spoke of God like that and Jesus revealed God to be like that. The Jews had a legal God, the God of the covenant. The Greeks had unfeeling gods. The Stoics taught that God could not feel anything. He was impassive. 
The Epicureans taught that he was a detached God. The suffering that went on down here in the world didn't trouble him. But Jesus came along and revealed a God who was a God of sympathy. You know how vital human sympathy is. Well, you have in heaven a high priest who is sympathetic to the situation you're in. You may not be sympathetic, you may not always find sympathy from fellow human beings. But Jesus Christ is the one who will put his arm around you and give you all the hugs and the kisses that you need and that you deserve. He's sympathetic. Not only can you hold fast to him because of his sympathy, you can go on enduring because there will always be reserves of sympathy there. But you can hold fast to him because of his understanding. And understanding goes beyond sympathy. Sympathy is one thing, but understanding is another thing. Look at verse 15 again. We do not have a high priest who is un unable to sympathize with us, but one who, uh, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. One who actually understands because he stood where you stand and because he sat where you sit, because he's been through the situation that you and I are going through. He's been there before you. For, uh, I forget how many years, 15 years was it, I was an examiner for a degree in theology. And the students in our college knew when examiner's day was every year. You couldn't have kept it a secret if you tried to. And there would uh, always be short tempers and anxious moments during that day as people were awaiting the outcome of their degree examinations and looking forward or not to their results, as the case may be. And you know, we tried always to be sympathetic to students. They didn't always seem to appreciate that fact or to realize that we were being sympathetic, but we were. And I longed on many occasions to have the opportunity, which of course I never did have, of taking some of our students who'd struggled through things into the examiner's meeting to show with what sympathy their exam papers were dealt with. Examiners bending over backwards to try and find an extra mark here or an extra mark there, to try and push them across a class category if they could do so. And you know, uh, even if we talked sympathetically to students, they never really grasped the sympathy that was around the examiner's table because they never had a picture of the fact that the examiners understood where they were. They looked at the tutors, the lecturers, the examiners. They were overawed by the bunch of doctorates that they had, the clutch of degrees that they carried together. They'd seen them as teachers and authors, people who seemed to know their subject well. It's amazing how you can fool people, isn't it? <laughs> they were the clever clogs, and these poor students were, were trying, grasping, to, to reach up to that standard. The fact of the matter was very different. The examiners were sympathetic because those around the table had themselves actually struggled with examinations in times gone by, could remember the butterflies in the stomach, could remember the sheer panic as you turned over an exam paper and thought you couldn't answer a single question. Could remember what it was to get the names of scholars mixed up when you were attributing various views to them. They could remember, some of them, what it was to have failed exams and to reset. It was more than sympathy. It was understanding. And it is that understanding that you find in Jesus Christ. For all your failures, for all your weaknesses, for all your temptations, for all your pressure points, for all your rejections, he understands because he was there. What greater understanding could he have than the cry that he issued from the cross showing you how much he understands rejection? That terrible cry of his God forsaking him. It's not only sympathy and understanding that should make you hold fast. It's also the trustworthiness of Jesus that should make you hold fast. 
He is one tempted in every way, just as you are, yet without sin. And you know that's even more wonderful, because it says to us that Jesus Christ not only experienced what you experienced, for, but far worse than anything you will ever experience, because you will give in. When temptation comes, there will be a threshold that you cross. But temptation came to him, and he never reached the threshold of crossing it, of giving into it. Satan will turn the screw in your life a little bit, and you will fail. But Satan kept turning the screw in Jesus' life, and he never failed. He never snapped. He has experienced it far more than you and I will ever experience it. And yet he came through, tried, proven, trusted. You can rely on him. The sinlessness of Jesus is no fiction. It was a battle for him as it's a battle for you. It was a constant real temptation as it's a constant real temptation for you. As someone has said, the sinlessness of Jesus doesn't consist in an absence of human weakness. It wasn't that he found it easy floating through life, brushing temptation off here and there. It wasn't an absence of human weakness, but an ever-present victory over temptation that makes him trustworthy so you have a high priest who is sympathetic who is understanding who is trustworthy don't let go of him let us hold fast to him that high priest and to the faith that we profess but the exhortation is not only to hold fast to him it's also let us go to him Verse 16 says, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He does not look down from heaven with lofty disdain, but longs to come alongside us to be our help. And we simply need to draw near to him, taking those steps of faith that approach him. Let us draw near, says the author to the Hebrews. The point is that the original readers of this letter were actually drawing back, not drawing near. And maybe some of you have just been in a static position for some time. And you're surrounded by pressure points and problems and temptations and struggles and failures. And you know in theory that there is this great high priest in heaven and you want to hold on. But I tell you, you can do more than hold on this morning. You can go to as well as hold on. And you can turn in those simple steps of faith to this marvelous high priest. Look at what it says in verse 16. Packed full of spiritual nourish nourishment. Where do you go? Well, you go to the throne of grace. Some people, when they're in difficulty in this country, when they've exhausted every channel of redress, when they've tried the local council and they've tried the courts of law and they've tried the civil service and they've tried their MP and they've tried the ministers of the crown and they've still got nowhere, sometimes they write to Buckingham Palace and a word may come down and some action takes place. You're invited to go not to a constitutional monarch but to the very realistic monarch who rules in our world who sits on a throne. But do you notice the marvelous balance there? Where do you turn? You turn to a throne of grace. There is power and love perfectly combined. There is majesty and mercy blended in one. There is strength and there is grace to cure all your problems. How do you go? Well, you're encouraged to go with confidence, not with brashness or arrogance, but nonetheless with a confidence that you will not be turned away, but that you will be heard and that you will be helped. Why do you go? Because there you can receive mercy and find grace to help you. God will step in to alter things, to change things, to enable you to cope to sanctify you that bit further, to enable you to approach the situation differently, to give you courage and confidence
to keep going through. When do you go? Well, you go in your time of need. You know, go when you're up against it. When you've come to an end of your resources. When you're broken. When you don't know how you're get, going to get through or go on. You go when you feel a failure. When you're hiding from other people things that you know to be true about your own life. life but you hope that they never discover because they might write you off. When you're in that time of need, you go and you find grace and mercy. He has proved himself to be worthy of trust. It works. So turn, believe, actively take the step. Put your trust in him. Go to him and discover to him to be a faithful and merciful high priest. Many of you will know that my wife and I have been through some difficult days in recent months. We rejoice at the outcome of them. But as she said when she was here yesterday morning, there were some days which were very dark and we thought the outcome might be very different. And during some of those bleakest Days. Early one morning I awoke and turned to the book of Hebrews with more than a passing thought that I had to prepare for these Bible studies somehow through it all. I was reading through the whole book, not just these chapters, in order to be nourished spiritually myself. And there I came to verses in Hebrews chapter 6, the very next chapter, verses 18 and 19, that in the J.B. Phillips translation reads like this that God has given us his sure word so that we who are refugees from this dying world might have a source of strength and might grasp the hope that he holds out to us. This hope we hold as the utterly reliable anchor for our souls, fixed in the innermost shrine of heaven where Jesus has already entered on our behalf. He is there, your great high priest. Find in him the utterly reliable anchor for your soul, for it is fixed in the innermost shrine in heaven. He is your great high priest. So hold fast to him. Go confidently to him. And there be met with grace and mercy. Amen. The Bible says, let the elders who rule well in teaching, a preaching be worthy of double honor. And I, I believe it would be good to give honor to the Lord and to Derek for the hard labor, particularly in the midst of the pain and the concern that he and his wife have gone through over their child, Richard. I think it's good just to applaud him this morning, show our appreciation for the way he's brought the Word of God to us. <laughs>